Hey students, welcome. And today we are gonna get into chapter four of your text. We are talking about war and gold, um, the beginning of the American era. So this is part one of a two-part lecture. So let's begin. Lecture questions. So this part of chapter four, we are gonna be discussing how does the Mexican-American War begin? Uh, what is California's role in the Mexican-American War? How does the war impact California? And then finally, how does the California gold rush start? Here are our key terms for this lecture. So before we get started talking about the Mexican-American War, we're going to talk about a little bit of background here. Um, the first thing to be aware of is that Americans had been moving west um, really by the, starting in the 1820s, 1830s. Um, and in the 1830s, the Mexican uh, government decides to stop the flow of Americans into Texas. Um, that will set off a rebellion in Texas that will lead to the establishment of the Texas Republic, uh, basically where you have a group of Tejanos and Americans living in Texas who are declaring Texas um, independent from Mexico. Now, you should know that Mexico never uh, acknowledged Texas's independence at that part, at that point in time, but it was a way for the Americans to start to think about how they were going to move into the West. Um, and it certainly did inspire the Bear Flag Revolt, right? Because again, the Bear Flag Revolt was a group of Americans in California who were declaring California independent as a, as a California Republic, right? So um, you see that the beginnings and the sort of seeds of this type of mentality, you can trace it all the way back to the establishment of the Texas Republic, which existed from 1836 to 1845. In 1842, and your textbook talks about this event, there was something known as the Catsby Jones Affair. And this is when a Commodore, a United States Commodore, um, decides that he is going to sail up from Peru um, to Monterey and essentially claim Monterey for the United States, mistakenly thinking that the United States and Mexico had already gone to war over the California province. So we can see indications of this mentality as far back as 1842. So even though the Mexican-American War does not officially start until 1846, you are definitely going to see all the way back in 1842, Americans moving into California, eyeing the province. The Catsby Jones Affair just proved to the Californios, oh, hey, this is what they're planning. And so you're starting to get this discussion amongst the Californios in the 1840s. Um, you know, what are we going to do if the Americans come in and they want to annex us, they want to take, take our, our, our state, what are we going to do? Um, so that set off a series of discussions as well. And I mentioned in the last lecture that some Californios said, no problem, let's just become part of the United States. Others said, no, let's not. Um, so that's going to be create a division. In 1845, um, the United States is going to annex Texas officially. So it'll be President Tyler before he leaves office and turns it over to President Polk. Um, he will officially annex Texas for the United States. So Texas will become officially part of the United States in 1845. When this happens, uh, the Mexican government cuts all diplomatic relationships with the United States because they see this as an act of aggression by the United States because they never recognized Texas as an independent republic. They thought of Texas as essentially being in rebellion from 1836 on. 
So, um, so that's going to cause immediate tension between the United States and Mexico in 1845 when the U.S. annexes Texas. In 1846, um, the United States and Great Britain, or England if you prefer, sign a treaty that allows Americans to settle in Oregon. So the British actually had officially claimed um, Oregon and the Oregon Territory, which is essentially Oregon and Washington today, was all part of that Oregon Territory. Um, the, the English had officially claimed that territory, but they are now saying um, that they will allow Americans to settle there. And essentially what happens is just it becomes part of the United States sort of organically through this process. And then finally, also um, in 1846, what we talked about at the end of the last lecture, the Bear Flag Revolt, right? So you've got this a group of Americans, this rogue group of Americans who bust into Rancho uh, Sonoma, uh, Rancho Petaluma, and they're basically lifting up this flag, declaring that um, California is now an independent republic, which will eventually help you know, hypothetically, I'm assuming in their minds, uh, be annexed by the United States, which is really sort of what they wanted. Um, so you see this buildup, right? You see that something is going to happen, something's going to give. So now let's talk about how the actual start of the war happens. Okay, so when President James Polk takes office and he takes office in uh, 1846. He is going to make a promise to the American people that he is going to fulfill the manifest destiny. In other words, that he wants the United States to stretch from the Atlantic coast to the Pacific coast. And he was willing to do just about anything to make that happen. And he really wanted especially California because even though at this point they still don't know about the gold and everything else in California, they do understand that California is very strategically located on the western shores of the North America and that it is a already engaged in this Pacific trading network that could be very beneficial to Americans. And so President Polk essentially wants to pick a fight with Mexico. And the first thing that he does is he actually sends a diplomatic delegation down to Mexico City. And headed up in this diplomatic mission is a man by the name of John Slidell. And John Slidell is basically tasked with going down to Mexico City and trying to negotiate a payment for California. Um, from the Mexican government. And California was, or uh, um, America was willing to pay $30 million to the Mexican government for this territory. The Mexican government just flatly refuses. Um, and so at that point, Polk becomes desperate. And he decides that he is going to send a military force into some disputed territory along the Mexican um, and Mexico and Texas border. So there's this, uh, these two rivers. There's the Nueces River, which is about 150 no miles north of the Rio Grande. And then there's the Rio Grande, that's 150 miles south of the Nueces River. The Mexican government considered the Nueces River the actual border between Mexico and Texas. The American government contended that no, it was the Rio Grande that was the actual border, southern border of Texas. So there's this 150 mile wide disputed territory and Polk decides that he is going to send a group of soldiers down into this territory. And it inevitably causes an armed conflict and dispute between a group of Mexican soldiers and a group of American soldiers. And uh, some Americans are killed in this armed dispute that takes place. And Polk now has his reason to declare war on Mexico. So he goes to the United States Congress in May of 1846 and he says, can we get uh, a declaration of war? And the Congress voted for the war but there were a lot of vocal opponents to going to war with Mexico. 
most of politicians who were not friends of President Polk understood that this was a very much a staged act of war that the Mexicans were simply defending the territory that they thought was theirs um, and that the American military really had no business being in this disputed territory. So there were some very vocal opponents. Um, Abraham Lincoln was a very vocal opponent to this war, um, but ultimately they got the votes that were necessary in order to uh, declare an act of war and basically the Mexican-American War is going to begin. So as I mentioned already, of course, California is a major motivation for going to war. Um, it was uh, uh, you know, positioned um, perfectly for the Asian trade market. Um, Thomas Larkin had begun to uh, lay the foundation for support of a U.S. takeover in Northern California. Thomas Larkin was a longtime resident of Monterey, and he had established himself in a business in Monterey, and he basically had started to recruit the local California population there um, into believing that it would be best for California to become part of the United States. As I said, um, there were some Californios that actually agreed that this would be a good thing for California, um, but there was also some very vocal opposition to it, especially in Southern California, right? So you see here's Monterey located right here on the Monterey Bay, um, and then down here is where you were going to have the heart of opposition to California becoming part of the United States. But for the most part, a lot of the politicians and people who were living up here in this region of the state, by the time the war breaks out, they had already sort of decided that it was okay for California to become part of the United States. Okay, so the Mexican-American War is often referred to as Mr. Polk's War. Um, and for obvious reasons that I've already mentioned, that essentially this war was instigated by the Americans. However, it was not an easily won war for the Americans. Um, most of the fighting will take place in uh, Mexico and central Mexico, places like Monterey, places like Veracruz, and eventually Mexico City as well. Um, when the war broke out, there was about 75,000 Mexican citizens living north of the present border. So these people are now going to have to decide um, which side are we on? Do we take the side of the Mexican government? Do we take the side of the Americans? Um, and as I mentioned in California, those two groups were already talking about this and had been divided on this particular issue. Um, so basically what you're going to see are little pockets of resistance um, to uh, the Americans in California, um, but as I said, most of the fighting is going to take place in Mexico. So a lot of the um, fighting is along the Gulf Coast of Mexico, and as I said, eventually Mexico City. Okay, so here we have a map, which is a wonderful thing because it tells us a lot. Um, so as I mentioned in already, here you have the Nueces River um, right here. And again, the Mexican government is saying this is the southern boundary of Texas. Um, and then here's the Rio Grande and the Americans are saying this is the southern boundary of Texas. And so Polk sends the troop under Zach Taylor's command into this area. That's where the armed conflict takes place. And that is basically why the war breaks out. So once that happens, you're going to get some uh, American soldiers marching further down into Mexico where there's gonna be a series of battles near Monterey, um, down here in Tampico, down here in Veracruz, and eventually Mexico City. Um, you had Americans that were stationed in Mazatlan, um, so an American Navy ships um, under the command of Commodore Sloat 
will leave Mazatlan and sail north, where they will go to Monterey. Essentially, Monterey um, gives capitulates to the Americans almost immediately. And as I mentioned, Thomas Larkin really had a lot to do with that. He had kind of laid the foundation for that to happen. So there's really no resistance here in Monterey. But keep in mind, and also keep in mind that Monterey is technically the capital. Um, here you have a map that shows the Fremont Expedition, as I've already talked about. John C. Fremont came to California. He was basically a spy, um, but he was surveying and mapping the region and everything. And his headquarters was here at Sutter's Fort. Um, he is going to form the basis of the California Battalion, which is going to send an expedition down to Los Angeles, because in Los Angeles, in San Diego, there are groups of resistors to the American takeover. So um, you're going to get the California Battalion, which is going to be led by Fremont, coming down into Los Angeles. They are going to be met with resistance. And then you're going to get Kern, uh, Kearney's expedition, also an American expedition, going overland into California where there will be a ma major battle, the Battle of San Pasquale, which will be the bloodiest battle in California during the Mexican-American War. Okay, so here you have like a timeline, and again, this is just basically so that you can have a sense of the way in which um, the Mexican-American War unfolded in California. Um, so you've got Sloat and Stockton, both of them commodores uh, from the U.S. Navy, um, sailing into Monterey in July of 1846 and taking over Mon Monterey easily, raising the American flag over Monterey. In July of 1846, the Fremont and the California Battalion set sail and they go down to San Diego. In San Diego, the Americans will occupy from July until October of 1846. Um, in September of 1846, a group of Californians um, led by Andres Pico and others will revolt in Los Angeles and take it back from the Americans. The Americans were also occupying Los Angeles at the time. In October of 1846, Californios from LA will go to San Diego and take it back for three weeks. So you've got these, like I said, bands and groups of Californios who are very much um, opposed to this American takeover, and they're fighting, they're fighting. Um, and then you've got Kearney's expedition that's going overland. They are going to reach the outskirts of San Diego in December of 1846, and that's where the Battle of San Pasquale will take place. Um, by January of 1847, the Californios are going to surrender to the Americans, and the Treaty of Coenga uh, will be assigned um, between the prominent uh, Californios and the Americans. And so that essentially ends the resistance in California to the American takeover. So even though the war itself, the Mexican-American War, will continue to into 1848, um, it basically ends in California in 1847, and Americans are going to occupy uh, California from January 1847 on. Okay, so as I mentioned, you know, there is uh, these pockets of resistance, mostly in Southern California, Los Angeles, in San Diego. And keep in mind that these Californios are well equipped um, on their horses. They are superior swordsmen. They are excellent swordsmen. And they know the terrain. They know the area. So in that way, they were at um, an advantage. They will retake some parts of the Southland, Los Angeles and San Diego for four months, and they win four battles. So the idea that somehow the Americans come into California and they weren't met with any resistance or no fighting or anything is absolutely false. There were Californios who did not want California to become part of the United States. They fought 
and they fought valiantly, and in some cases, they fought successfully. So we are going to talk now about the Battle of San Pasquale. Okay, so the bloodiest battle in California history in terms of its uh, context within the Mexican-American War is the Battle of San Pasquale. It is now a historic site. You can go and visit it. Um, you can visit the canyon where this particular battle took place. And as I said, it is outside of San Diego. It takes place on December 6, 1846, which just happened to be a very damp, foggy, morning um, on the outskirts of San Diego. Californios knew that Kearney's um, battalion was coming through and they wanted to set a trap for them. And so they figured that this particular pass at San Pasquale was a perfect place to set a trap. Um, and what ends up happening is there was essentially an ambush by the Californios. And when they do this, they are able to surprise the Americans. The Americans are relying almost solely on their firepower. And because it is such a damp, foggy morning, they are unable to successfully use their guns because of this foggy weather. Um, and so the sword becomes the primary weapon in this particular battle. And as I mentioned, the Californios were very good with the sword, and particularly on the backs of horses. Um, and so they were able to use this to their advantage. Ultimately, 21 Americans will die, including three officers. Uh, Kearney is wounded. 11 Californios were wounded or and one was taken prisoner, prisoner. However, even though this was a very dramatic victory for the Californios, ultimately the Americans are going to have such a powerful presence both via land and sea that the Californios will be forced to capitulate and sign the treaty um, in January of 1847, the Treaty of Coenga which ends the fighting. But the Battle of San Pasquale could really be seen as sort of the high point of California resistance. Okay, so the Battle of San Pasquale sort of indirectly leads to another um, important event in California history at this time period, um, the Powell Mall Massacre. Um, which takes place after the Battle of San Pasquale in December of 1846. So there's about 11 Californios who are fleeing from the Battle of San Pasquale. They're trying not to get captured, etc., by the Americans. And they find refuge at the Palomal Ranch, um, which is located right here. So you can see here's the Battle of San Pasquale. Here's San Diego, okay? Here's the Battle of San Pasquale. And then here we've got um, uh, the Pall Mall Ranch. And so they go there and they become captives, these Californios, of the Luceno um, Indians, and a group of Indians from the region who took them to a ranch nearby, a place called Warner's Ranch. And they were essentially put to death um, in this very sort of dramatic and also violent way. And um, they were tortured. And it was said that they, the Indians who did this to the Californios were very much influenced by an American who um, was, uh, was present. And he basically had some kind of a personal um, beef with one of the Californios. And, um, and in response to this massacre and this torturing of these Californios, 22 Californios, along with a group of Kawea, will attack and kill 100 plus Luceno Indians in revenge for the killing. This is known as the Temecula Massacre. So what this shows you, um, and one of the reasons why I even mentioned the Palomal Massacre, which is something that is very much in the minds of the Luceno and the Kawea, even to this day, uh, most uh, people who are members of the tribe and that know anything about tribal history know about this particular event, is it shows how interesting 
California's um, political dynamics were at this point in its history. You've got all these different players here, right? You have got the Californios, right, who are the, you know, land-owning elite of the state. You've got the native people who are being basically torn in a bunch of different directions. They are making alliances with different groups of people, right? And in this case, the Luceno people made an alliance with an American. And that American is there squatting as a foreigner in California, right? But he has this influence on the local native population. Um, at the same time, some of these other Californios, they are aligning themselves with the Cahuilla, and the Cahuilla have decided to take the side of the Californios, and so much so that they are going back and they are murdering and massacring 100 plus Luceno Indians in response to this uh, killing. So w the, the thing that is so fascinating to me about the Palomo massacre is that it represents just this complex and in, in many cases almost twisted relationships that people had um, and different allegiances that people had to each other in early California. Um, and also it shows the diversity, um, the complexity of these uh, relationships. They're not predictable. Um, not all Native people sided with each other, right? Um, they sided with different groups of people. And again, so much of it is about survival. It's about trying to uh, maintain your way of life and survive in these very strange, troubling, um, and very fluid um, situations and moments in history. Okay, so back to the Mexican-American War, which is going to conclude with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which will be signed in February of 1848 between Mexico and the United States. What does this treaty do? The first thing it does is determine the border of Mexico, the northern border of Mexico, which is defined in the treaty as one marine league south of San Diego, across to the Colorado River, to the Gila River in New Mexico, and then finally to the Rio Grande and the southern border of Texas. 500,000 square miles will be ceded to the United States as a result of this treaty. It includes present day, of course, California, Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, Utah, and Colorado. The United States is going to pay $15 million to the Mexican government for secession of this land and property and citizenship rights were promised to the inhabitants of um, these areas if they chose to stay. So the way that it worked was essentially that um, if you were um, in these northern Mexican provinces and you chose to stay when they converted over to the United States, as long as you had lived there for a year, you automatically became a citizen of the United States after a year. Some people chose to leave and decided that instead they wanted to go into Mexico. Um, there wasn't a lot of people like that. So of the about 75,000 or so that lived in these northern provinces, only about maybe 8,000 um, people actually um, left those northern provinces and came uh, uh, went to Mexico. And it's understandable why, right? Um, the, the people that lived in these northern provinces really thought of themselves as part of those northern provinces, and certainly the Californios did. They didn't think of themselves necessarily as wanting to run back to Mexico. They thought of themselves as Californians. Um, so it was pretty, it was kind of a, a com complex and difficult um, situation. Um, but for many, I think it was just a matter of, well, this is our, our home. We're not going to leave. Um, now, the issue of property rights becomes convoluted in this treaty. In an article called Article 10 um, of the treaty, it guaranteed that Mexican land grants would be honored. Okay, so the initial uh, 
language of the treaty said that the Mexican land grants would be honored when California and all the other areas of the northern provinces became part of the United States. But in order for a treaty to become law, it has to be ratified by the United States Senate. When this treaty got to the United States Senate, this line, this article, Article 10 in the treaty was omitted from the final draft of the document. So even though there was lip service that was paid to the Mexican government that property rights would be respected in these northern provinces from these former Mexican citizens, um, when the final draft of the treaty was created, this, this line was omitted, which left all of those property owners extremely vulnerable moving forward. And we are, of course, going to talk about that in upcoming lectures when we talk about the difficulty that m many of these California families had in holding on to their land grants. So approximately 13,000 American soldiers die in the uh, Mexican-American War and about 50,000 Mexicans, including citizens, um, died because there were massive sieges of cities, uh, Mexican cities, during the Mexican-American War. So it was a very destructive war um, and in the minds of many people it was a very unjust war. I do have a link to a uh, video um, this war in the um, the video links, the instructor video links for this week. So please, if you get a chance to take a look at that, um, watching episode one of that part six series um, will give you a sense of how the war started and how the war unfolds. Okay, so what are the reactions of Californios to the Mexican-American War? Um, well, as you can imagine, they were divided. Some were optimistic about becoming a part of the, uh, of the U.S. Others were more suspicious, like the, the last Mexican governor who you see pictured here, Pio Pico. Um, he remained suspicious of the new Americans from until the day he died. Um, you know, part of the issue here is that slavery is still a thing in the United States um, when California becomes part of uh, the U.S. and uh, Pio Pico, who you see pictured here, is mulatto. He's half black. Um, and so, you know, this probably also, you know, led to um, him feeling even more suspicious of the Americans. Um, Mexico had outlawed slavery by this time. So um, some of the former soldiers that had fought to resist the American presence um, will become outlaws in this new state and they kind of go around and terrorize, you know, um, places and they kind of cause trouble for the newcomers, the foreigners that are coming in. And especially as we get into the gold rush period, right, where it's just this massive influx of foreigners um, into California. All right, so we are going to talk more about the gold rush in upcoming videos, but I just wanted to start us off with the discovery of gold, right? That happens on January 24th of 1848 by a man by the name of John Marshall, who is working for John Sutter. Remember, John Sutter is this guy that has this huge Mexican land grant in the Central Valley, what is now San uh, Sacramento. Um, he is working for John Sutter. He's building a sawmill along the American River. John Sutter is all excited because, you know, California has now become part of the United States, and he sees himself as being really on the cutting edge of, you know, being able to have an advantage to develop this state. And he finds this gold, and he lets Sutter know that he's found this gold, and they try so hard to keep it a secret. Now, the thing is, is that the locals in California actually already knew that gold had existed because gold was discovered in San Francisco Canyon in 1842. But the Californians had managed to kind of keep it to themselves, this initial discovery. So, of course, it won't be until this American discovers it that it becomes this big news. And it also happens to co coincide with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and the acquisition of California um, into the United States. 
So they try to keep it a secret, but as you'll find out when you look at the video on the discovery of gold, this man by the name of Samuel Brannon, who was a Mormon, came, come to California with a group of Mormon settlers, decides that he's going to use this as an opportunity for him to make money. Um, and so he wants to advertise this, and he runs through the streets of San Francisco shouting, gold, gold, from the American River. And he sets up a shop where he starts to sell tools that are necessary for mining gold. So he actually becomes one of the richest men in California as a result of his quick thinking on this issue. By June of 1848, gold fever will have caught on and people are starting to talk about gold in California as far away as Europe and Chile and China. And so we're starting to really earn this reputation as not only being a place where you could find um, economic opportunity, but hey, you might even be able to get really, really rich if you find some gold. So this is an old photograph of this site where gold was originally found. Um, they had were building this sawmill that eventually they just kind of abandoned because the, why buy it? Why build the sawmill when you can just pan for gold? <laughs> So miners, of course, rushing um, from all over the world um, to the American River and other places um, in the surrounding areas after the discovery of gold. So what about the Californios, right? Here they are. They've just had this war that has now completely changed the future of the state that they live in. Um, many of these Californians decided to get involved with the gold rush. Hey, why not? Let's go leave our towns and go to the mountains and look for gold. Um, some uh, Californios were able to set up, you know, merchant uh, supply um, chains that were able to um, make them money. And so they were able to profit, some of them, from this. Um, and then especially in Southern California, um, large numbers of uh, Mexican and Chilean miners come to the mines and they, th th this causes all kinds of problems, um, especially from the Mexican miners that were coming from Sonora, Mexico, which is, uh, how, was a very uh, mining rich region of Mexico. And these miners were coming and they were experienced and they knew where to find the gold. And so when the Anglo miners come along and the American miners and they start to look at these guys with envy and greed, and so there's gonna be a lot of discrimination that's gonna be based on sort of the level of experience of these various miners. And it, this will cause the basis for a lot of violence, um, a lot of claim jumping and, and things like that um, moving forward. So the Californios, they kind of have this, this mixed reaction to the gold rush, right? Some of them get involved in it um, and are able to profit from it, and it goes well for them. Um, others are, you know, having to deal with this influx of people into their land, straining their resources, um, squatting on their land, um, mining maybe even on their land, right? So, um, so it's a it's a mixed reaction. So the Californios. Um, are having to deal with not just the fact that they are now no longer part of Mexico, they're part of uh, the United States, but they also are now dealing with this influx of foreigners coming from everywhere all over the world for the gold rush. So that's all for now, and uh, have a good one. I will see you on the next one. Take care. Bye.